Welcome back to another Retro Crazy. This is the Commodore 64 Repair Restoration Part 2. I cut the last one short because there was more than enough material for the, the two different parts. I didn't think there was initially, but I didn't realise just how much I recorded. So we'll continue on with Part 2 and the first thing we're going to do is look at sorting those very, very poor rusted and corroded keyboard springs. So the springs have now been steeping in vinegar, just plain white vinegar for about 20 minutes. I know that it's not an alkali that I'm trying to neutralise, however the gentle action from the acid in the vinegar, as you can see the colour of the, the vinegar has changed and the springs themselves are looking a lot better. They're not perfect but they are looking a lot better. What I now need to do is start by neutralizing this acid. Hopefully you can see all that contamination in the bottom, all that sludge, and that's all come off of these springs. There's still a couple of springs that aren't great, but on the whole they are looking much much better, as you can see a little gentle rub and look what's coming off. So now that the worst of that is off, I'm now going to spray liberally with some isopropyl alcohol. I'm now going to leave these for five to ten minutes just for the isopropyl alcohol to evaporate off because I've got one final trick up my sleeve. These have had a chance to dry off and I've moved them about a bit, broken them up. I did say I had one final trick. Now, these are never going to be pristine. They are still fully usable, no problem. But obviously dropping them into a, even a mild acid has damaged the finish. Some of them are still shiny, but most of them are now dull. So how do I protect these and stop them getting any worse? Well, silicon oil. I use this because it's not actually scented, unlike the WD-40 uh, silicon oils, which are scented. And I'm just going to give them a spray. It's quite a thin silicon. But what this will do is this will coat the springs and help protect them from any moisture incursion. So they're now coated. They will dry off a little bit. They're now ready to be refitted. And as you can see, just with the surface it's coming off, it's actually nowhere near as bad as the camera shows it. So let's move on to rebuilding the keyboard.
that's both keyboards done. This is the one that's going to go back into the grey machine. I've used the better springs on this because this is the one that's going to go away and get kept nice and original. This one has got the older springs. It's very faded. It's going to go into the poor quality case. However, I do have to say, I prefer this keyboard. It's much nicer. This one just seems a bit spongy. This one just seems a little bit nicer. So next, let's bring up everything, start putting everything back together. So that's as far as I'm going to take this one at the moment. I'm going to obviously be testing it first and I don't want to button everything up if it's not going to run. So I'm going to pop this to the side and we'll assemble the next one. So before I build this back up, I have a little modification I wish to make. I was doing a look through Amibay, amibay.com and I came across a very interesting device and I'm going to test it out on this. The seller is called Plasma, P-L-A-Z-M-A, and he does these. These are anti-static arresters. Version one and version two, he kindly supplied these so I can test them, and I'll probably fit these to my 1200, or one of the other Amigas. And these ones, the version 1.1, are designed for the C64. They're very small and neat. And one of the biggest killers of the SID chip on the Commodore 64 is static. Whether you're plugging a joystick in, or even something as simple as touching the pins and causing a static shock and it blows the SID. Not good, especially in these days where they're becoming rarer. And to fit these, you genuinely just drop it over and then solder it on. And there's one for each. Now, looking at the solder there, I'm gonna see if I can lift some of that off first. But once finished, it just sits like that so so neat and it's no higher than the screws it'll sit on the standoffs it won't affect anything now these little circuit boards are not only conformal coated but the whole bottom is also silk screened so that's going to give extra protection from shorts and that'll just sit on there so let's have a look and see if we can fit these just now. Well, that's all done and that takes no time at all. It's such a neat installation. And if it protects the, the SID from being destroyed, oh, it's well worth the investment. I mean, that is so low profile. 
Now the cost of these is five euros a pair and three euros forty cents shipping and that's to the UK and it was here within four or five days. It's absolutely phenomenal. So well worth it, superb, especially seeing as they do these ones which will fit other systems. I mean the theory is that should potentially work with the Atari ST and various others as well. So between the two of these you're going to be able to cover a lot of systems. Not all systems are going to need it but certainly the 64 is one of them. And using this as a daily driver, you know, I, I, if you don't know what daily driver is, this is the machine that if I'm going to run the 64 is going to be the one. It's, it's well worth it. Well worth it. So let's take this now and let's fit it into the case. And again, like the previous system, I'm going to leave it like this so I can do some testing. And that is next. So here we are at testing. And one more thing just before we get there. You can see in the background, I've been using my old Commodore 64 power brick, which has been tested. The voltages are fine. However, they are notorious for failing and blowing your 64. We've got something new. This came from Keylog.com. It cost me 43 euros and another 10 euros in shipping. I have to say this was also before all the, the duty and VAT was being added. So that may have gone up a bit. But this is a Commodore 64 dual power power supply. Very nicely packaged. And it has twin outputs. One to power Commodore 64 and the other one should power something like your 1541. Much more stable, much more robust and less likely to blow your 64 in the long run. So let's get this connected up and let's get to testing. So now we're all connected up. As you can see this particular model does the Commodore 64, the VIC-20 and also the 1541, the 1571 and the 1581. Doesn't do the 128, that's another option that you can get. But this should cover everything for my 64 for a while. So let's find out what happens when everything goes on. I've currently got side AV set up. Power is on, making a nice light up display showing our power is on. I've got the dead test in, so let's see what we get. So far I've got a display and everything looks to be correct. So let's see what happens as it runs through. And there we go, that is a successful pass, including the SID. So I'm really happy with that. So let's switch this off and swap over to the other machine. So here we are swapped over to the next machine. Let's see what happens. Okay, so that's successfully run through its test with a bad control port. So I'm going to have to have a check and see exactly what that is. Because I'm actually not sure. I don't think I've seen that error before. So bear with me while I go and check. So after some checking, 
The only result I can find for this 4066 at U28 bad control port fault seems to point towards the SID. I don't have another SID to drop in. I could drop it in from the other system, but I'm not willing to do that because I believe the voltages are different and that will blow something, which is not really optional. I don't have a Swin SID spare, it's in the C64GS. So at this time I'm going to run with the system as is and I'll revisit that later once I get my hands on a, either a replacement SID or a Swin SID. So time to finish putting these together. So that's them both now assembled. This one is in absolutely beautiful condition. It's gone together nicely, but it's in really, really nice condition. That being said, the other one, yeah, it's not so good. It's very yellowed. In fact, you can see it's, it's night and day. The casing is, is broken in a number of places. There's a chip out the corner. Only one of the retention clips remains. The others are missing, so everything doesn't quite clip together right. I do have the second clip on the back now holding, uh, along with the middle one, but yeah, it, it really needs a new case. Or, or possibly if somebody makes the, the clips that you can glue back in, uh, yeah, this, this has seen better days, this one. I am going to try leaving it out in the sun if I ever get some sunny days at the moment here in Scotland and see if sun bleaching will bring this back. It might do, you never know. And this power LED is currently held under the piece of blue tack so that it's non-permanent. Again, I'll see if I can get something. I should say this LED, now that it's on screen. I'll see if I can get something to do a bit more permanent fix without having to glue it into place. So what's next? We've got, surprisingly, I, I am genuinely surprised both of these machines ran as well as they did after recapping. I did expect a lot more problems with the 64s because they're notorious for it, but I'm pleasantly surprised with, with these two. So next I'm going to look at how to actually get software into the C64. Historically you would normally use something like the, the data set or you used the 1541, 1581 uh, disk drives. However, modern technology will look at something different and that is the Pi 1541 with the built-in Epix fast load cartridge. Nice little compact unit. This is obviously part of it because you can see there it says you need the Pi 15410 hat which is what that is and that needs to be paired with a Pi Zero. In this instance this is the Pi Zero W because I wasn't able to get the Pi Zero the difference being this has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Not really needed for this however this was about £25 delivered and this about 12 13. The Pi Zero, if you can get it, is about five pounds plus the, the, the postage, which is 2 99 Again, I'll put the links down in the description. The other thing I'm going to need are some pin headers because I need to be able to mount this onto the hat. And the nice thing is, based on this design, somebody created a nice case but you don't have to go to the extent of going and buying it if you currently own a 3D printer. So here's one I made earlier. You 3D print an upper and lower case and a set of four standoffs. 
might actually only need two standoffs. Eh, not to worry. So, it actually prints like this, so you get the best finish on the surface and all the supports inside which you break off because, let's face it, who cares what the inside looks like. With this, this sits on the bed and this is all support material, but again, it's on the underside, you're really not going to see it. So the first thing we've got to do to get all this to work is to fit the pin headers onto the Pi Zero. So let's do that now. With that done, we can now look at installing it into the case. And there we are, we're done. All finished, together, all buttons accessible, ready to plug in and test in a short while. So next on the list of things to do is the data set. I have a number, I've got a nice boxed one, I've got these three, I've probably got others kicking about. And it's important when you go to refurbish these that you make sure you get the right kit when you're going to do the job. So this is a Taiwan model, as is this. This one, you can tell by a different bezel, is made in Japan. Now, a quick check through eBay and you'll find DataServe and he does a range of different ones depending on what you have. So I've got two Taiwan versions and I've got a Japanese one. In this video, I'm going to concentrate on just one of these just to get it up and running so I can test the 64s, make sure everything's fine. So let's move all this away and let's open this up. So that was four screws and everything comes apart. You can see the amount of dust and debris that's kicking about. I'll clean all that out. I will give the head and the record head a clean, the pinch roller especially. And then I've got the tape counter belt to replace and the main drive belt. The main drive belt looks like I'll access through this screw here. So let's crack on.
So let's try some Jeff Minto this time. And there we go, successful load of Attack of the Mutant Camels. Unfortunately, I was reading the instructions and this looks like it's a joystick only game, which is a bit of a pain. So, uh, well, we've got sound. And we can fire, and if I remember, that's down. I don't think I've got an up key though. Yeah, it's not going to work very well if I can't shoot them. Okay. Well, apparently I can do something. Oh well. So that's Attack of the Mutant Camels. Let's switch this off. That's superb. So the data set's working. Everything seems fine. One more thing to try. So now we've got the dual cart in, the fast load with the uh, 1541 Pi Zero. Let's find out what happens when we power on now. Now straight away we can see it says fast load, so that's loaded and the 1541 Pi0 has powered up. Now if I get this right, um, okay, so up and down. Hopefully, if we do this, and now the green lights come on, showing that it's running. Something's loaded. If we load the wrong one, it will crash. And this is supposedly one of the ultimate tests to see if it's running is to run ghosts and goblins. Now I don't know if the bug that I've got will work. It's loading from tape again or disc should I say, because the LED is back on. Hopefully that means it's going to finish and I've loaded the right version. Well, that's certainly running. But I don't know how to start the game. I don't have the instructions. Well, sound effects on and off. I 
I may not have the right connector in. However, you can hear from that, this is a, a complete success. I am really chuffed that this now makes this a, a very usable C64. Let me turn the volume down. So it makes it a very usable C64. It's rock solid now with an updated power supply. Fully recapped, ready to go. So hope some of this has been a bit educational. Thank you for watching. Remember to like and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next Retro Crazy.